Well, good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. I am so glad to be with you guys again today. It's midday Bible study. Yep, it's midday Bible study again. And we are here as we're continuing to discover the word together today. Uh, what a beautiful day it is. Um, it has been an awesome time in the study of Haggai. I don't know if you all have ever explored Haggai before, but Haggai has been just a little book with a lot of power and a lot of punch to it. And I hope that you all will stay with us today and you all will enjoy uh, this, uh, this study. Uh, we also uh, welcome you to uh, come into the space uh, that we will be at afterwards for a further discussion because uh, we're going to go on and talk about this great uh, word and some of the things that we're going to learn from it. Last week, we were honored and privileged to have Dr. Verndell shall do who broke that word down. She is an amazing vessel. I don't know if you all have ever heard her, but those of you who have not, uh, she is amazing. She also has a stream that's uh, here on Facebook every Tuesday and Thursday called Touchdown Tuesday and Touchdown Thursday. And you don't want to miss that. That happens at six o'clock in the morning every week. She is faithful to that devotional and it is always power packed. But just to piggyback on what she uh, helped us to understand is complacency does not have a place in God with us. And so we're going to continue with the word of the Lord in uh, Haggai and the second chapter. So if you all will, those of you who are on Facebook, if you would not mind, if you could go on and share uh, this on your particular platform, and if you could go on and give us some likes or loves so that we can continue to be encouraged in this space. And then we're going to pray for you. We're going to pray for me uh, that the Lord would speak through me in this this time. So Father, thank you, God, for this day. Thank you, Father, for those who are listening in our Zoom and Father, those who are listening in this uh, space here on Facebook and those who will listen later on YouTube. God, we pray, Father God, that your anointing would be presence, God, because if your presence is not here, God, then we have no right to speak on your behalf, God. So I'm asking, Holy Spirit, uh, that you would articulate what this word is saying today. And Father, that you would give us the wisdom to exegete uh, this word that you have given to us, God. And Father, that you would give us the message today that you want us to hear and understand uh, that we extrapolate from the message that was given to Israel at the time of their exile. And God, we thank you and praise you, Lord God, that your word is living and it's life-changing. And God, we thank you, God, for the life-changing word that you will give to us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen and amen. amen. So God bless you guys. So if you all will turn to Haggai, Haggai, the uh, second chapter of Haggai. Haggai is that little bit that hides behind Zephaniah. So if you'll turn to Haggai, the second chapter, and uh, it begins at the first verse, and it begins with this writing. It says, one of the 21st of the seventh month, and the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet saying, speak to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and, the, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, unto the remnant of the people saying, who is left among you who saw the temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? But now take courage, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Take courage also, Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and all of you people of the land, take courage, 
declares the Lord. And work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. As for the promise I made you, when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth the sea also, and the dry land. I will shake all the nations and they will come to the wealth of the nations and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. And on the 24th of the ninth month and on the second day of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priest for a ruling. If a man carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches bread, with his fold and cooked wine, oil, or any other food, will it become holy? And the priests answered, no. Then Haggai said, if no one who is clean, unclean from a corpse touch any of these, will the latter be unclean? And the priests answered, it will become unclean. Then Haggai says, so is this people. And so is the nation before me, declares the Lord. And so is every work of their hands. What they offer there is unclean. But, do, but now do consider from this day onward, before one stone was placed upon another in the temple of the Lord, from that time one will come with a grain heap of 20 measures, then would be only 10. And when comes the wine vat and draw 50 measures, that would be only 20. I smote you with every work of your hands with blasting wind, mildew and hell, yet you did not come back to me, declares the Lord. Do not consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day unto the temple of the Lord was founded, consider. Is the seed still in the barn, even including vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree? It is not born fruit, yet from this day on, I will bless you. Then the word of the Lord came the second time of Haggai on the month saying, speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the, thor the thrones of kingdom and destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations. And I will overthrow the chariots and their riders and the horses and their riders will go down, everyone by the sword of another. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take Zerubbabel, son of Shetiel, my servant, declares the Lord, and I will make you a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. Amen. Amen. That's a lot of word, isn't it? Because that's yes. from the second chapter of Haggai. So as we go through this particular book and we look at this, we're looking at three words that come from the prophets, three words that come from this prophet. And the first word that we will find will be found between verses one through nine. Verses one through nine, we're going to break it up in three sections because there are three different sermons that you can pull right out of this. And you may have seen some different things as you studied this word, but this is what the Lord has given to me. Verses one through nine. The first thing that you're going to see is you're going to see uh, how Haggai begins to talk to the people. And before I announce that section, I want to go on and, and just kind of outline some things. The people now have been working at least seven weeks. And Haggai had preached now his second sermon on October the 21st. He's now beginning to explain to them where they're going on. This is the second or the seventh month of what they call in the Jewish calendar, Ethian or Tishri, 
which is also in our calendar today would be considered September and October. So October the 21st is probably the closest that most theologians think that that date would be pinpointed. So the 21st day would be considered the last day and the great day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And you can see that in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter and the 34th verse. So you would wanna write that down so that you could go back and look for yourself a little bit later. Zerubbabel, the governor, had showed them some remarkable uh, generosity because he gives about what would be considered about $6,000 of his own gifts and his own money that he had given toward the temple. Now, $6,000 doesn't sound like a lot to us today, but think about what that would look like back in like 580, 560 BC. That is some kind of money that he has put into this, uh, into this market. And then besides the other gifts that had been also given into the sacred treasury by the people themselves, there's a lot of things that have been given into investing into this new temple. They erected and dedicated this altar uh, unto God in the exact same spot in which it had been destroyed. Remember, during the time of Babylon, when they had been captured, the Babylonians had destroyed Solomon's temple. The first temple had been burned to ruins. And so now all of this heaps of ruins have now been destroyed. And now they have to build on to this ruined area so that now it can be uh, built upon on this old temple in this same place. And now what has now been destroyed, the people are now excited. However, from one perspective, there's a group of people who are excited about this new work. But then there's a group of people, an older group of people who saw the glory of Solomon's temple. They were young people maybe at the time, or they may have been older people who had lived through those 70 years in captivity in Babylon, and they knew the glory of Solomon's temple, and they were brokenhearted by seeing what this temple looked like today. And so the first message that we see in this is that looking back instead of looking ahead is not the thing that God wants us to do. He wants us not to look back, but he instead to look ahead. Because if you look at the text here, it's not only the fact that they're looking behind, because in verse four, it says, do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets proclaim, thus saith the Lord, return now to your evil ways and from your evil deeds, but they did not listen nor give heed, declares the Lord. Your fathers where they were and the prophets do they live forever, but did not my words and my statues where I commanded your servants and your prophets to overtake as the Lord of hosts proposed to us to do in accordance to our ways and our deeds. So he had dealt with us. And on that 24th day, the 11th month of Shebat, the Darius of the word, you heard them declare, you continued, and I'm sorry, I'm in Zach, Zechariah, so I know you're confused. So let me go back here. Um, let me go back and read this and forgive me for that. I'm in the wrong page. Let me go back. He goes on and says that who, verse three, he says, who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how did you see it now? Does it seem to not to compare 
to you like nothing in comparison? Have you ever found yourself comparing the way things used to be? Maybe it's an experience that, you know, do you remember how church used to be? Oh my God. You know, when I used to go over to 8201, church was just, I mean, it's nothing like when you got to 118. You just don't know. And, and people at who came at 118, they tell people who came at the House of Hope, oh, you know the House of Hope? Oh, no. It ain't nothing at the House of Hope because at 118, let me tell you, that was the time. The glory was the presence at the time. We were, we would stand in lines. We would stand in lines in the winter and in the summer because it was just so good. We were just forcing ourselves to be in there because we're always looking back instead of looking ahead. And that's what was happening. There was weeping that was happening. There were weeping for the people who saw saw the temple and they were so happy and there were weeping of the people who remembered the temple of old and they were crying because they noticed that the things that were used to be there were no longer there. Amen. Have you ever found yourself looking back upon what God had used to do for you and wondered why isn't God doing that right now. Had you ever found yourself in the place where you said, oh God, I remember when you used to meet me in this place and the intimacy that we used to have. Oh, we used to have church like this. And I remember when pastor used to preach like this. And I remember when my Sunday school teachers would teach like this. And I remember when the choir would sing like this. And I remember when we we would shout all day and we didn't have to worry about a television audience and when it came on and when it came off because we would just go in the glory of God and we were unashamed. Oh my God. And we didn't have to worry about all of that Facebook and that YouTube nonsense. Oh my God. Why do we have to deal with that? Because we're going and we're looking behind and we're not looking ahead because one of the things that was missing from this temple one of the things that many of the Talmudists was telling us and the Talmudists themselves were those people who of, of the Jewish council who believed in rabbinical Judaism, they believed in Jewish theology and they studied Jewish cultural life. The difference that was happening in the new temple that wasn't in the old temple, what was missing, it was the Ark, uh, the Urim, and the Thurim, those were the things that, that they believed hold the message of God because there was like this um, uh, body armor that they used to have. And then there was the decoder of the messages that were there that was prominent in the old temple that wasn't in the new temple. The old holy oil was missing. And then that sacred fire wasn't there anymore. And, and the tables of, of stone was missing from there. And, and the pot of manna, you know, they didn't have the pot of manna because, you know, remember they had collected the pot of manna because remember on Sundays, they always had the manna that would collect extra so that they would not have to collect it on the Sabbath. And they put that in a pot so that they could always remind themselves that God was a provider for them in the wilderness. But the, the pot of manna was missing and, and Aaron's rod, it was missing. And, and, and oh my gosh, what? There's, no, there's nothing there to remind us of all of this glory that we had. And they cried. And then the people couldn't hear 
what the difference of those who were crying of joy and those who were crying of tears because they were looking behind and not looking ahead. What we have to learn, believers, is that God is always ahead of us. He's never looking behind. He's always in our future. We think about all the stuff that's in the past that, that, that helps us to reflect the things that happened in the past. And we think that everything that we are prospering to do, the things that we're called to do, all is contingent upon our past. And, and God is showing us through Haggai, is showing the people through the temple that it doesn't matter what they had in the temple of the past. It's still holy. It, it, it's still right. It's still a place to be worshiped. And, and the things that you have done in the past, the people that have gone on now that you don't have around anymore does not prohibit you from doing what God has called you to do, what God has anointed you to do. God has things ahead of you that you don't know anything about. What does Isaiah say? He says, behold, I'll do a new thing. He says, do you perceive it? <laughs> will, will you even notice it? Or, or will you be looking behind? Will, will you be so focused on what happened in the past that you won't perceive that I've got something ahead of you? I've got something ahead of you, believers. I've got something ahead of you because I am a God that I don't, I don't change, but I also surprise you because you don't know the things I know. You don't see around the corner. You don't see ahead because I've got things ahead of you that you can't even imagine. And you think that the best things that happen in your life are behind you, but the best things that are going to happen for you are straight ahead. And so you have to look ahead to where God is. He's straight ahead of you. And so we have to look ahead because instead of looking behind us, we have to look ahead because God is building something ahead of us. Don't be frustrated by things that will try to stop you in front of you. We know, according to Ezra, the fourth chapter and the first through the fifth verses that the Samaritans wanted to be a part of the building of this temple. And when Israel said, no, we've been charged to do this, this is the task that God has told us to do, they try to frustrate that purpose. Read it for yourself. You can read it for yourself in Ezra, the fourth chapter and the first through the fifth verses. They try to frustrate the purpose. They tried to get in front of the purpose, but God wouldn't let it be because when God's purpose is in front of people, no matter how much they try to frustrate it, God's purpose is still going to work. Stop looking behind God's people. Let's look ahead. Let's press toward the mark of the high calling of God, which is before us. Isn't that what Paul said? He says, forgetting those things which are behind, I press forward. We've got to learn how to press my people, my believers. We've got to learn how to press because the Lord wants us to look ahead and stop looking behind. They, we, they wept because they only saw those things that were behind, but God has something ahead of us and he has something that's good. The temple might've looked different. It might not have looked in all of that glory, but God wants us to press forward. And of course, because of that, it's gonna be consecrated and God had a message for them 
even beyond that, because beyond that, God even has a tempo that he has for them. He told them that, look, I'm going to shake the earth because I have a temple in the millennium that you don't even know about. There's a temple that you and I will see when the dead in Christ will rise first and you and I who are alive and remain will be caught up to see that temple that God will have because the silver belongs to the Lord and the gold belongs to the Lord and the temple that God is going to build is going to be greater and more spectacular than we have ever seen in our eyes and I promise that the temples that are made by God's hand is going to be greater than any hands that man could have built. Are you looking for God to build his temple, the temple that he wants to build in your life through the promises and the provision that he has made for you as he has called you to do? I know I do. Let's move on. Verses 10 through 19. Let's look at verses 10 through 19. As we read them before, it starts out where he goes on and he asks about the ruling of the people. And he asks a lot of very curious questions. He asks them about meat. He asked them about this. If a man carries holy meat, he asked in the fold of his garment, right? He says, if he, he touches the bread with his fold and cook wine and what have you, the priest answered, is it unclean? And the priest said, well, no, it's not. But then Haggai asked the question, if it's unclean, if they touch a corpse, does it become unclean? And then, of course, the priest answered, of course, yes. Why? Because they, he began to outline that the people were failing to confess their sin to God. Even though they were doing the work, they were doing the work still in the midst of sin. They were doing the work in the midst of their junk and stuff. And remember when we were looking at Haggai, the first chapter, he was saying that the reason why you all weren't being prosperous, and Dr. Shell do talk to us about this, the reason why they were losing everything that they had is because they were in sin. And so they started doing the work, but they kept in sin. And so the second thing that we have to learn is that in order for us to be blessed, that we have to stop failing to confess our sin. And, and it's not just saying it with words in our mouth. It's by confessing our sins, by turning around. It doesn't mean that I'm saying, oh, God, I thank you for forgiving my sin. And then I'm going right back out the same door and doing it again. It's by saying, God, I confess that I am weak in this area. I need your help to turn around in this area and I'm gonna get this one right. And then I'm gonna work on number two plan. Because what happens with them is that they kept being unclean. They kept touching the things of God and they were making the temple unclean. They were making the things that they were working on unclean because they were unclean. And so in order for us to do the work that God is calling us to do, we've got to get ourselves together. And I'm not talking about we're going to ever be perfect. We're not perfect people. But we have to acknowledge the fact that there are things that are in our life that have to be corrected by our God. When we were children, when we were children, whether or not we were raised by auntie or grandma or mama or grandpa or whoever we were raised by, there were rules of that house that we were a part of. There were things that we got punished for if we did not follow the rules. And whether or not that punishment was a beating or whether or not that was punishment was 
a timeout or whatever it was that was in your family and in your particular scheme, but whatever it was, it was always a reminder that we broke the rules. And what God wants us to know is that when we break his rules, that not only do we have to confess that we broke the rules, but then we have to determine to turn around so that we can be in the middle of his will. We fail to confess our sins, then he's not faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. They were failing to confess their sins. That's why they were in trouble. That's why their nation wasn't blessed. And how do we know that? Because the scripture says in verse 16 that even the grain heap of 20 measures only 10. And when they came to the wine, the wine vat, they were only drawing five measures uh, that would only be 20. And they began to realize that even God was allowing wind to come and mildew and hail so that they were not blessed. Their crops were not blessed. There was nothing that was coming. And they kept asking, well, why is this happening? Why is this happening? We're building the temple because they were failing to confess their sins. They were continuing to do the work of the Lord in their sinful ways. You and I have to stop. We have to be honest with God. You don't have to be honest with your neighbor because it's none of their business what you're doing. But you have to be honest with God and be honest with yourself and say, okay, God, look, I am not doing this well. And I'm going to look in the mirror and I realize that my walk and my talk is not congruent with this word. My walk and my talk is not congruent with the way that you have ordained for me to be. My walk and my talk is not congruent with the, uh, the position that you are ordaining me to be. So God, I thank you in advance that you're able to wash me. Just like, remember what David said, David was not a perfect man. Remember, David killed a man just so that he could sleep with a woman to undo everything that he had done. Remember David, David, he says, have mercy upon me, O God, yes. according to thy loving kindness, yes. according to thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Purge me with hyssop that I might be clean. Wash me that I might be whiter than snow. Now, the one thing that we know about David is that David's sin was ever before him because Bathsheba was forever called Uriah's wife. She was never called David's wife. She was always called wife of Uriah. So that was always a mark. But God did forgive David because David was sincere and God still considered David a man after his own heart. So even if we have the consequences of what's before us, God can cleanse us of our sins and wash away so that we can continue to do his work. But David, because of all the things that he did, he couldn't build the temple. That is why Solomon had to do it. So we need to be right. We need to get confessed. We need to go on. So let me go on before I stay too long. Verses 20 to 23 is the last message that we see in this verse. The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of that month. And he speaks to our spiritual leaders. This is why we have to pray for our spiritual leaders. This is why we have to pray for our pastors, our teachers, our leaders, those who are in charge of us, because they have a heavy load. They have a heavy load. Hear what he says. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the thrones of the kingdom and destroy the power 
powers of the kingdoms and nations, and I will overthrow the chariots and the riders and the horses and the sword. And on that day, declares the Lord, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Sheetiel, and the servant declares, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord. One of the things that we have to learn to do for ourselves and also pray for our leaders is the area of unbelief. Unbelief is the area that will cause us to cause us to destroy the promises of God before us. You hear oftentimes in your prayer time what God is speaking to you and I each and every day. Our leaders hear oftentimes what God is speaking to them every day. But unbelief causes us to try to thwart God's plans in our lives. You hear the devil saying, you're too old, you're too poor. Or you'll hear what Seely said, you know, what, the, what was said to Seely in color purple, you just too ugly. <laughs> you know, you'll hear that kind of stuff. You'll hear all kinds of mess from the enemy who will try to distort you and try to divert you from the plans that God has for you. No, it's all a lie. It's a lie from the pit of hell. You have a plan that God has deposited in you. And when God has that plan, regardless of your belief, you have to believe God for his word's sake because the word of God says that his word does not come back void. It accomplishes what it pleases, go where he has sent it. And we also know that we do not believe the word of mankind, but we believe the word of the Lord because man is unreliable, but God is reliable. And so when we know that God is reliable, we have to stay and stand on what he says. And unbelief is the, is the mark of where we can go that will cause us to fall and fall deeply into depression, anxiety, and they will keep us off of the square of being where God wants us to be. This final message, this third message that Haggai is preaching is preaching to the governor directly, but it's also preaching to us today because Zerubbabel needed special encouragement directed to this work. Satan attacks our spiritual leaders and he attacks you guys as well because it is our duty duty to pray for those who are leaders. And for those of you who have special uh, appointments on you, once you have established your work, it is our duty to pray for that work that's upon you. Because empires fall, great empires fall, because the enemy is trying to thwart that work. Because unbelief, circumstances discourage us to build the work of the Lord. But special faith is what gets us going. It's what keeps us going. It's what makes us believe despite sickness. It's what makes us believe despite circumstances. It's what makes us believe despite anything else that comes our way, even negative people who will be in your ear, even close people to you who will say, this is not the time. This is not the place. You are not ready. They'll tell you all kinds of things. And God is telling you, you are ready. This is the time. This is the place for you. You have to hear God very clearly. The scripture says, you will know his voice and another you will not follow. You will not be, dis you will not be distracted when you hear the voice of the Lord. Believe, believe God, believe God's report. His report is the one that we will believe. Whose report will you believe? 
we will believe the report of the Lord. Haggai is a short book. It's a little book. It's a small book. He's a, a minor prophet with a big voice that has spoken to us in a big way. I pray that you have been blessed by the book of Haggai. And I pray that you will do a deep dive yourself in the book of Haggai, because there is a blessing in reading this book and studying it for yourself. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will be encouraged and you will be strengthened by the word of God. And let me pray for you now that you would be encouraged because the things that we need to know from this is that we need to look ahead and not behind. We need to make sure that we're confessing our sins and we need to stay away from unbelief and believe the word of the Lord. Father, thank you so much, God, for those who are listening, those who are still on, God, Father, those who will hear this later at a later date. Father, I pray, Lord God, that Haggai, the word that, that he was able to speak to Israel and speak to us today, God, will resonate with us. And I pray, Father God, that your peace will rest upon your people, Father, as they build your work, Father, that they would know that you're with them, Father God, that any instructions that you give to us, God, that you already have at your hand upon us to do the work. Help us, Father God, not to be distracted about those things that don't look the same way that it looked for people in the past, God. Help us to rejoice in the things that we see today. Help us, Father God, to always be in line with you. Uh, we're not perfect people, but Father, you want us to always be in right relationship with you. And even when we make mistakes, even when we sin, God, you tell us that if we confess our sin, that you're faithful and just to forgive us of that sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, right. And then Father God, help us to remember, God, that whatever is not of faith is sin. So Father, our unbelief, God, sometimes, Lord God, puts us in a place of vulnerability, God. And Father, we don't ever want to be accused by Satan, God, to not believe you, Father, for your good report. And Father, we know that we're sometimes like that father that came to Jesus with his little boy, Father, who said, Lord, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. And so God, because we know that we're vulnerable in that way, God, help us, God, to work on our unbelief. And then God, we just give it all to you in Jesus name. Now you may not be a believer, but I pray Father, that the Lord will be speaking to you today. And if you have not a relationship with God, I pray that today is the day for salvation for you. Um, God wants a relationship with you and you don't have to be anything special. You don't have to cleanse yourself before you come to him. All you have to do is just open up your heart and say, Jesus, come into my heart. Heart. I believe that you are Lord. I ask you to come in and make your home in me. And once you do that, then he will come in. He will cleanse you. He will talk with you. You have a right relationship with him. And the Bible says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord oh, shall be saved. It is not a question. It is not a, a, um, a population, a popular contest. It is just a relationship with him and he'll love you. He'll love you to the end of time and even beyond because heaven is guaranteed to you. So I pray that today you are encouraged. Those of you, you still have time to join us in our discussion on Zoom. We invite you to do that. And we always thank you for joining us on our midday Bible study and God bless you. We hope that you have a wonderful day and we'll see you next week as we start our new series in Revelation and we hope that you will be with us. God bless you and have an amazing, amazing day. Thank you.